You're listening to the Ones Ready Podcast, a team of Air Force Special Operators forged in combat with over 70 years of combined operational experience, as well as a decade of selection instructor experience. If you're tired of settling and you want to do something you truly believe in, you're in the right place. Now here's your favorite CCT personality, JTAC extraordinaire, embracer of the ridiculous face, and like the shortest operator you'll ever meet, Peaches. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Ones Ready podcast. You're in the team room, and we have a very special guest today. We have the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, number 19, Joanne Bass. Ma'am, thank you for coming on. This is is an honor. I can't believe that you or your people actually responded to to our request. I'm I'm a little shocked by that (laughs) uh, because at this point, it also means that we have officially made it. So <laughs> I, I'm kind of happy about that. <laughs> Why but, would you jinx so it, we, Chief? Why? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, we've we've made it now, right? I mean, we can only go down from here. So, um, but no, we we definitely uh, appreciate you coming on, and it's, it's an honor. So, uh, in the interest of your time, we want to have a conversation with you. We think it's important uh, for somebody in your position to help professionally developed body. And in reality, once you think you've made it, you really haven't made it. So, um, you know, for, for us enlisted folks, it's, you're pretty much the top you and, and the SEAC. So, um, it would be great to kind of pick your brain, which is what we'd like to do. So as a bit of an icebreaker, we want to know, we know you love coffee. So who's your favorite coffee and why is it trench coffee company? <laughs> Well, that was good, Peaches. I love how you slid slid that in there. I I will tell you, I have actually ordered Trench coffee, and I'm a fan. Like it's it it is some really good stuff. But you know, um, I I don't have a favorite. I just like good coffee, and so and I also like supporting small businesses. And so, anytime I have an opportunity to get out there um, and buy some, I do. But yeah, I, I mean, it won't be the last time that I've bought from Trench as well. But but I do want to say something. You know, you, you talk about it's an honor. It's it's truly my honor to just have an opportunity to spend some time with you guys and to dialogue. And for me, it was an easy yes. Um, I think you know a lot of people if they read my bio know that at a very important time in my career. Um, I, I spent time at the 2-4 STS and it was really that time, which was pretty formative to me um, and, and being grown up by some of the operators that worked there. And, 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 and oh, by the way, I was the first um, female serving in, in ops there and they didn't know how it was going to turn out and I didn't know how it was going to turn out. Um, of course, this was in the 90s. And again, really that, that assignment alone helped shape who I am, helped shape my career, um, and, and just gave me, I think, perspective on the bigger why we do what we do. And, and again, I've served with some great Americans there, and so there's no way that um, I could say no to you guys. And so it's my honor to spend a little bit of time dialoguing, and I look forward to all that we're going to talk about. Awesome. Well, uh, you're obviously well known around the community because you've spent time with us, like you mentioned, but um, more so, I do want to just kind of address the elephant in the room, if you will, not in a bad way. Is there but, an elephant? Well, I didn't know. I mean, okay. there, there's, a so, there's a social media elephant that will, you know, we will definitely, <laughs> uh, we will definitely be on the receiving end of uh, probably, <laughs> probably you as well. Uh, but we're no stranger to social media uh, hate, so we're we're good. But um, you know, you you were you have a very active presence on social media, um, just like your predecessor. And you know, I guess it was it was probably January, maybe beginning of February, sometime. There was a little bit of a uh, we'll call it a a snafu, for lack of better yeah. better terms. But um, I was wondering if you wanted to address that in any kind of way. Yeah, sure. I will. First off, you know, it's interesting. Um, I I do. People often ask me, hey, why do you use social media? Um, And and do you wish sometimes that maybe we didn't? And I would and I always say, absolutely not. Social media is not going to go anywhere. It's a platform that we can use to be able to reach people at scale. and, And for that, it's a good thing. I personally have it in my strategy 
to use social media as an opportunity to listen and hear the, the hearts and minds of our airmen at scale. And then I also um, like the um, opportunity to have a flattened communication um, avenue. And, and I think that that's huge. And, and that's why we do social media. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't go without um, failure. And that's just a part of life. And in social media, especially in the digital arena that we are in, we are going to have our trials and errors and nothing is going to be flawless. To that end, um, yeah, back in January, there was a very challenging um, situation that my team went through and a challenging situation that two of our airmen um, had to experience and for that particular situation and peaches, I'll be honest, you know, I, I, I won't go into great detail about it, but what I will say is, you know, we, we get a whole lot of email traffic and message traffic from leaders across our air force that want to highlight their people. And, and that's another great piece of the social media is it gives us an opportunity to highlight the goodness that's going on in our air force. And in this case, um, I received some email traffic on, you know, here, here, let me, let's highlight a great airman and what they are doing um, for their base and, and for their community. And with that, um, there was also a commentary on there that I admitted I didn't fully digest it in a way that should, that, that there's no excuse that I shouldn't, um, especially as a senior leader. But when I read the commentary that that email posted, I read it for the good intentions and I read it and saw the good and not the negative. And that negative is something that was hurtful to that person's, um, you know, um, um, significant other, previ you know, previous significant other. And so all that to say it caused what, all good storms do on social media. It caused a big storm and really caused people um, who don't even have anything to do with the situation to also get involved and jump in. And, 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 and just, you know, it was a typical 72 hour social media storm. Um, and it was unfortunate on many accounts. As soon as that post went out, um, and as soon as we realized that um, that that it was taken negatively and on on a particular individual, we you know we reached out that following day. I told my team I want to reach out to both individuals and one make sure that they're okay. That's always the the first piece. And and how do we need to proceed from here? Um, and, and I talked to both individuals. To be honest, they it, talked to them apologize to them. And really those are the only two people that I needed to apologize to. And that apology is that, you know, we, we are sorry that this situation is going on and how can my team make this right? How, how can we get back right so that you can get on with your lives? Because social media can start to take a whole, um, you know, world of its own. And then all of a sudden, again, you just have people and a whole lot of keyboard warriors out there who get out there and, and just cause strife, division, and, and a lot of other stuff. Um, you know, one of the individuals just had to pull off all their social media um, because uh, they were getting um, disrespected, harassed, threats, et cetera. Again, and most of the people who are doing this are not even people who are currently serving in our military, um, currently even involved in a situation. Again, People, keyboard warriors, who it's easy to type, you know, some things out. So, so for that, I'm, I'm, I mean, I regret it. That was a huge lesson learned for, for my team on. Hey, we can't, we can't be quick to hit send or post or whatever. But I won't let that incident deter us from the greater good that we have to do when it comes to social media. You know, good always wins and, and our intentions are always good. Our intentions are always to highlight the goodness of all of our airmen and their families and to further the, um, the cause that we have, which is advancing um, our strategic priorities and getting after our nation's business. And we can't allow things like that to distract from us. Right. And I think the difficult part with social media is just always that portion of like, you know, like you said, you pick, you took it one way and then somebody else saw one small detail yeah. that was in there as well. And then they ran with the, that. And I'm sure that, uh, 
um, glad to hear that it's resolved. And as far as the airmen and the, you know, the apology, I'm sure it was accepted. Um, and like, you know, the people that are listening out there, um, like Chief Bass is saying, she has enormous respect for all the people in the community. She was part of the community for a long time. And she, um, you know, apologized to the people that were affected by that, um, specifically. So, um, again, thank you for, uh, just addressing that. We just wanted to get that out of the way so we can uh, start talking about some of the uh, <laughs> start talking about some real stuff but Brian let me let me just add something too that that I would be remiss if I didn't and that is that you know again the digital era is something that is relatively new to um to our nation to our force and and ha- and, and those right and left boundaries are a little bit unclear um, I think we also we we got a lot of work to do on I think making all all airmen all people a little bit more digitally literate on what's truth what's not what's the source you know where is it coming from because the challenge is we have a lot we're in an information um, age right now and there is a lot of disinformation going out and a lot of it is from adversaries, you know, but, but if we don't grow people to be strong enough to understand the disinformation piece, we're, we're not going to be in a good situation. We see that going around. We saw it all last year. We continue to see disinformation, but we have to grow um, at least for where, what I care about is growing airmen and families that they don't just take, you know, five seconds of something they saw and like run with it. And that, and that is it. And, and I see that throughout where, again, um, it, it is rough on social media because people see a five second whatever. And you all know as leaders, you could you could you could give a you know, you could be talking for five minutes to your team and somebody take 30 seconds of context out. And then you're a dirt bag. So so I, I, I would offer that people have to be thoughtful and mindful of that. Who's a source? you know, what's, what's the character, you know, is it relevant? Is it credible and, and move on. So thanks for letting me say that. Yeah. Right. And I think- well, jokes on you, chief, my team has it right because I'm actually a dirt bag. They don't have to take it out of context. So <laughs> that's basically my thing. No, I, I think it's, that hard to believe. <laughs> I think it is important to address that there's a uh, certain perspectives. And if you only get one perspective and a person's digging a hole to, to China with that perspective and not you know, opening up a view and seeing what's actually going around and what's actually happening um, to just recognize that and, um, you know, view the intentions rather than just the one thing that you might have seen on social media. And there are a lot of things going on um, on social media all the time uh, with the memes and everything. And and they do portray a certain view for a longer period of time than really necessary without getting any of the information that uh, really needed to back up what is actually being said. Um, So, I wanted to get to um, some of the other questions we had here. Um, so the first question is, you know, we always talk about the things that we're doing and obviously you're at the top of the enlisted right now and you're um, doing a lot of different things throughout your day. You're just discussing how you barely get to see some of the things the ne- until the night before when you're reviewing what you're going to be doing for the next day and then going over that kind of thing. It takes a lot of motivation. It takes a lot of uh, character to be able to do those kind of things. Um, and we always ask, what is what is your why and why do you do the thing that you do and why do you continue to wake up every morning and spend your nights, you know, reviewing notes, doing all those kind of things um, as the chief medical sergeant of the Air Force? Yeah. Hey, so for me, my why is is pretty simple. It's it's people, you know, and it's the thought of you know, doing my best to be able to prepare space for those who will come in after us. Um, and I'm sure Peaches, you probably feel this way too, you know, as a chief leading in our Air Force, you know, we've got to prepare um, the way for our folks. And so my goal is that, um, you know, I have an opportunity uh, to create a space where every airman can be their best and to perform their best. And then someday take the baton from us and then continue that legacy. And so it's because of people and it's because of, you know, I've got two girls that I raised. And so I need a strong air force that they can, you know, continue on with. So it's all about the people for me. No, that's, that's, that's amazing. And I think from, from where we're all sitting, it's the same thing, right? And we always tell everybody, it's all about the people. It's all about doing good. And, you know, we're all kind of nearing the end and you want to leave a place better than the way you found it. Right. So uh, I don't know some of the things that you've been getting after to try to make people's uh, lives, I guess, a little easier or better. Uh, the one of the recent things is the the women's hair standard that that came out, Chief. And I know uh, that that was a big deal. I mean, I follow you on social media. I've I've seen all the comments. 
Uh, but what are some of the other things? I'm not going to say beards. Oh, I'm sorry. I said beards. I mean, um, did we say beards? What are some of the other things <laughs> somebody, that you're getting did after? Did somebody say beards? Uh, to, to, did you somebody know. say beards? I kid, I'm sorry. Yeah. It must have been breaking up over on this end. Did somebody say beards? <laughs> okay, Chief, we won't put those words in your mouth. The beards are coming. Anyway, here's, uh, here's Trent with the question. All right. <laughs> so so let, let, me ju- let me just say real quick, um, it, it, again, this gets back to kind of that, you know, social media piece and people just see kind of, you know, the five second piece and, and, they, and they assume. And, and what people will also assume is, First female chief master in the Air Force. Of course, female hair ch- standards change. Couldn't be furthest from the truth. The reality is we've had a lot of folks working on this initiative for years and years. Um, and I have to give credit to the women's initiative team, the WIT team, who has provided probably about five years worth of work and data and, and analysis. And oh, oh, by the way, like I hate analysis. Like I hate data. Like it's where stuff goes off and dies. But anyway, like, so that's not me. I'm, I'm not a green, like, but they did all the work to, to come up with the why we needed to make that change. And, and I'm so glad we were able to do that. Um, there are so many things that we're, we're focused on and, shortly after getting in the seat, in fact, um, like day one of getting in the seat, I sat around a table with the MAGCOM senior enlisted leaders and, and we came up with a list and, and I'm, I'm not that clever. And so the list, if you look at my notebook right now is called the things to get after list. And that is, that is what it is. And that's a 12 to 24 month out. Here are the things that we believe we can, um, get after in the force. Some of them are a little bit tougher because they are um, matters, you know, it's a matter of law and we're going to have to get, you know, Congress to help support us in that. But there's not a thing, um, Trent, that we're that we're not looking at When, when it comes to the Air Force that we need. The lens that I'm looking at is what does our Air Force need to look like in 2030 Um, and what do What do our airmen need to look like in 2030 so that we can remain competitive for that high-end fight? That is the complete lens that I'm looking at. And so every single decision, especially when it comes to people operations, um, is is looked at through that lens. Does, Does the way we do fitness, our evaluations, our promotions, our assignment policies, whatever it is, is the way we do it today, the way it needs to look like in 10 years from now? And I'd be... Like no on all of it, you know, and and so at, there isn't a thing we we're, we're not trying to get after. You're going to see some fitness changes come out in in the next little bit, but but all of those will be I you know in my mind short term and intermediate fixes to eventually what we need to be in ten years from now. We may not even be doing pit fitness tests because we're using wearables and, and, and the ultimate goal should be that we know that our airmen are fit and we can, and and we have technology that can help us with that. Um, But, but we'll make some, some headway until we get there. So um, evaluations, a hundred percent. If we're the smallest air force we've ever been, which, which we are, we do not have the luxury to spend four hours on, on an EPR. Like those days have got to be gone. And so I've asked the team to look at, you know, like how, how are we evaluating people? Like how can we start to tell the truth on something? How can we not have a decoder ring to know what an EPR is actually really saying? Um, so it's lots of that, um, lots of thoughts on promotion, Man, I mean, there. I, I I wish I could just show y'all my list, but but there's a lot of people and talent management stuff, assignment stuff. But then there's a lot of policy stuff. We had a we have a lot of draconian policies that that made sense in the '90s, but they don't make sense today. And so to that point, there's not a thing that we shouldn't be looking at. But what I need all airmen to get involved with is they need to be, we need all leaders to empower airmen at every single level that they're sitting in because not all policies and processes need to be fixed by us. Like, you know, our airmen should be empowered to get after it in in their areas and do that. Absolutely, Chief. And that's something that I wanted to bring up. So especially when we talk about the boss and he talks about, you know, accelerate, change or lose, Notice there's no commas in there. Those are all three things that we're trying to get after. So how do those young airmen, how do people in our positions, how do we embrace accelerate, change or lose? And how do we get from the bottom up? Like you just said, how do we affect that process? 
We got to demand that our airmen are empowered. You know, when I came in the Air Force, it was interesting. My first supervisor was a senior airman, by the way, senior airman Brian Hurley. And he ran all of 74th Fighter Squadron operations. We need to get back to a place where our senior airmen are empowered to get after what they need to get after. And oh, by the way, you know, I mean, that's just, it's a stair step effect. When I talk to my troops and, and they come and bring something to me, I always ask them, is this something you could have answered or done? And if the answer is yes, then don't even bring it my way, you know, like Get it. handle it. I, I love it, Chief. Did you, know, you try to fix this problem on your own or did you use me as the easy button? Yeah. So, so, so we've got to do that, but somewhere we've become a risk averse type society and, 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 and again, and, but, but we own that we can change that. That's that, you know, that's part of culture. We need to quit being so risk averse. Are, are people going to fail a hundred percent? Have I failed a hundred percent, you know, but you learn through those failures and you keep moving out. Oh man, I can't even tell you how happy I am here to, to hear you say that, yes, we, we have made a turn to risk aversion um, because it's difficult to, you know, see if that is just something that, you know, it's my perception or like, but it's, it's good to hear you say that. That's uh that's interesting. So you mentioned, um, you know, the list and I imagine it's an enormous list of things that you are working through. So as you work through some of those, you've undoubtedly had to make some very tough decisions. So what are some of those tough decisions? Maybe not in detail, but uh, what are some of those tough decisions? And, and what was your decision matrix? What did that look like as you went through some of those? Yeah. Um, so when I think of tough decisions, I, I, I will really probably um, pivot and, and think more about the people piece. And every decision that I've had to make or every opportunity that I had to either advocate for an airman um, always weighs heavy on you, right? So sometimes it's not, we're not the ones making the decision, our commanders are, and as senior enlisted leaders, we have to give our best military advice, professional military advice to our commanders. And so I don't take those lightly at all because somebody's life is, you know, at stake or their career. And so those have always been the toughest decisions, you know, to to um, allow a member to continue serving or not um, or, you know, making, um, you know, determinations of line of duty determinations where a member's family will be impacted or not. Those are all very tough decisions. And the, the, the common denominator for me that has been helpful in my life when I've had to make those decisions, um, I have a great battle buddy in my husband. I've been married to um, Ron for a long time. You know, I met as a young airman at Pope Air Force Base. He was a young 82nd Airborne paratrooper um, driving around in a Humvee. You know, he didn't have a car, so that was our vehicle of choice. But anyway, he has been my good faithful and 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 he really helps keep me grounded when I'm when I'm faced with you know those those decisions that weigh heavy on me because somebody's career is impacted. So he's kind of the stabilizer and 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 helps me see the path. And uh, my question actually right along those lines is just um, like you said, we're, you're going through all these decisions throughout your day. You have to make a lot of them that are very important decisions. Like you're talking about, it's not just one airman per day that you're you know, discussing when you're going throughout your day and uh, all these reg changes, all those kinds of things. Um, you know, you have to internalize and accept all these decisions, just like, you know, for those guys that are going to be out in the special warfare community, as you make those decisions on the mission, you have to live with the things that you've done. So what are the, big things that keep you up at night when you're laying down in your bed and going through your mind, obviously you have to make peace with some of the decisions, but there's something that probably keeps you up and you're like, maybe I should have, or I need to do this or something like that. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that keep me up at night, you know, especially <laughs> now, you know, one, one of the things that keeps me up at night is that we won't move fast enough as an air force. I mean, that's like, that's real talk y'all, especially. And, and I think this community knows more than anybody where we are in the global landscape and 
the great power competition. Again, when I joined the Air Force, we were the world dominant power, hands down, air superiority, we had it on lock. And for the last 20 something years, our adversaries have been watching us fight the fight. And so they've studied how we do war fighting. And now fast forward to the day that we're living in today, our adversaries and our enemies will never fight a fair fight. And no longer is it just air, land and sea, but now we've got to you know, be, be focused on the space piece, the cyber piece, the information piece, you know, the economic domain, all of those things and our enemy will come at us any way that they can. And so what keeps me up at night, we won't move fast enough, not only as an Air Force, but, but we can't do this by ourselves. If we're the smallest we've ever been, we need our service partners to, you know, right there. And, and I spend a lot of time talking to Sergeant Major of the Army, Marine Corps, McPawn, you know, Space Force, you know, so glad we have a Space Force because if we don't dedicate time and attention and resources to that. And if we lose in space, period, we lose. And so so not moving fast enough as an Air Force, but also not moving fast enough as a nation. I mean, it, it that keeps me up because I, you know, and, and making sure that we don't give false promises or hope to the force, you know, like, like, as the same things I'm telling you, I'm like, we better be able to deliver as an Air Force. If we're telling our airmen, we need you to accelerate. And, you know, if we're telling our airmen, we need you to be innovative. Yet we don't have the mechanisms within our organization. Man, that's painful for me to see at my level because somewhere, somewhere we got to fix that. Chief, I, I feel you on the, the making promises thing. I've been talking about special reconnaissance for years now, and we're setting it up and trying to make sure that we're ready for all the future fights. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that, that pressure is insane. And, 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 and leading to the next question, that pressure has forced me, not forced me, but I have made some mistakes along the way. And I think one, one of the things we talk about all the time is, is mistakes that we've made throughout our career and how it's affected us and how it's made us better. Um, and so I, I hate answering this question personally, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What's the, the <laughs> biggest mistake that you've made uh, throughout your career or maybe uh, since you've uh, taken the seat? All right. Hey, I, I've like probably you guys, I've made more mistakes than I can count. Um, fortunately for me, um, they've all been ones that I've been able to recover from and learn from as an experience. And I say that because sometimes we make mistakes again and somebody's life is, is at stake. And so um, I think all of mine have been ones that I've been able to learn from. But I mean, when we say like even mistakes since I've been in the seat, you know, I think more broadly that the social media piece that I was talking about earlier when we first started was a mistake because not be, you know, it was a learning mistake definitely for me, but why, um, why it's more in fact impactful or why it pisses me off even more is because it impacted other people. And so anytime you impact other people, that's not a win. Yeah. Well, Chief, hopefully we've pleased all of the bro vets and that finally you have made amends and we can just move on. Trent and I were talking <laughs> about that before this one. So hopefully that's good. The flip side of that coin, though, is, you know, what missed opportunities um, have existed for you? What are what are those things that you were just, you know, maybe just a second late or maybe you were you were it was a project that you were just really close to getting finished and you just didn't quite get there. Do you have anything that that kind of keeps you up at night? Like, oh, man, that was so close. I almost got there, but didn't. You know, I don't, I don't know. I assume it's, if it's a missed opportunity, I wouldn't even know if it was one. So I got nothing for you. <laughs> I, don't, I, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I can't think of any missed opportunities. Well, you definitely haven't missed much. I mean, you are SimSaf now, so. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 on, on a serious note, and I don't want to get somber here. I think we all do have missed opportunities and, and let me tie this kind of into resiliency and, and families and connecting. If I did have missed opportunities that now, now that I'm thinking about it more, it was probably that I had missed opportunities with my family and my kids because I put work first. I mean, lots of them, especially when um, at my first command chief gig, I'll never forget my daughter. I think she was in fifth grade at the time. She's like, you're always on your computer. You know, what do you do? You, you know, you finish work and then you come back Oof. at home and then you're right back at it. Right. 
And, and for those of us who do have kiddos, I mean, you technically are only with your kiddos from like maybe five or six in the evening until about nine o'clock at night, like three hours, you're impacting your child. And so I had lots of missed opportunities where I didn't make the right choice. And so, so I learned from that error, like that was a mistake that, that I definitely learned from. And so what I learned to do, and, and I could do that at this point. And I don't know that every, everybody has this opportunity. When I was at NCO, I don't feel like my calendar was mine. So I didn't have the flexibility, but when you have the flexibility, um, you have to prioritize your family and your kids and your spouse and, and your significant other and not miss those opportunities or, or whoever, mom, dad, whatever, don't miss those opportunities because you only have them once. And so, you know, when we wake up and when we take off this uniform, like the only people who are going to be there is your family. Absolutely. That's a, that's yeah. a real good point. And that, as, as most of us are kind of coming towards the end, uh, I think you get to realize that a little bit more. But um, so in the interest of, you know, developing airmen and developing future airmen, like what is one thing that you wish you knew before you came in? And the reason why I'm asking this question is because our demographic is anywhere between 15 and 35, um, most of which are interested in coming in, whether to the Air Force or Air Force Special Warfare. So I'm interested to see what, you know, what you wish you knew when you came in. I wish I knew that I didn't know as much as I thought I knew. Um, you know, when, when you come into the military, I mean, you know, I, I, I specifically remember me being a snotty nosed senior airman. Not that all senior airmen are, but but I certainly was. And I remember being pretty critical of my leaders and thinking I knew best. And what I come to learn as I became a non-commissioned officer and then a senior non-commissioned officer was I really only knew that much. You know, like when when you've been to just one or two organizations, all your 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 sight picture is only that one or two organizations. And every time you go to another one and every time you have another opportunity, your sight picture grows and grows and grows. I mean, but but that never changed with me. Like I've always been hypercritical of others and critical of our Air Force. And I'll never forget when I was, a again, command chief at Goodfellow. Um, and I get the phone call from the chief's group that says, hey, um, and I'd only been there 14 months. They're like, hey, we want you to be the chief of PME. And this was, I got a phone call from the chief's group on a Saturday. And I'm like, PME, you know, I'm an ops girl. I'm like, I don't even like PME that much. Like, why is this happening to me? And so all that, all that to say, um, I was critical of our Air Force because I felt like we weren't doing PME right. We're not doing this right. And, you know, um, and then I get into the seat and now I'm the chief of PME. And, and again, my worldview opens up and I'm like, man, you know, boy, was I wrong. And then now, you know, I'm sitting in the seat as the 19th chief master in the Air Force. What a huge opportunity and privilege. Um, and I can see now others like me being super hypercritical. But man, until you have a full picture of all of the things that are going on from, uh, you know, the whole of nation, you know, our relationships with our uh, folks on the Hill, our industry partners, our partner nations, until you start to understand all of that and the challenges that keep us from being able to move out. Um, I wish back then I learned not to be so critical and that I really didn't know it all. Right. And I think that is a, a huge theme, just like we were talking about before with uh, the perspective thing, you know, somebody that walks into the, a shop is like, oh, why aren't there any of these? Or there's not toilet paper in the bathroom consistently, like little things, obviously, that impact lives. But uh, in the big scheme of things, it's not the biggest um, hurdle that leadership is trying to tackle as they're going through that. Um, along that same page, um, talking about future innovations and things that we might be looking forward to as far as changes in the air force and ways for airmen to speak up. Cause I do, like you were saying, it's very important for airmen to be able to be empowered, speak up and, um, you know, try to implement some of the changes that, you know, if there is a good idea, maybe it's being done in another uh, corporation or a different place that's, um, really savvy with that kind of thing. What kind of, uh, changes do you see as far as, um, where the military is moving towards and ways that airmen or anybody can start to implement those changes or bring them up in the correct channels 
Um, are there any specific changes or avenues like that that you're looking forward to or? Yeah, there, there's a whole bunch, Brian. I mean, again, the, the lens that we are looking at is what is, what is our, what do our airmen need to look like in the next 10, 15, 20 years from now? And how, and how do we get there? And I think what you're going to see is um, our future airmen are going to be multi-capable that again, if we're the smallest we've ever been, we don't have the luxury to be able to have airmen, you know, specialized in just one thing. So we'll have multi-capable airmen. Airmen of the future will also be highly digital, you know, they'll be digital natives more than we are today. Um, and so to that point, we have to start to now make sure that we are truly creating a culture where our airmen can be innovative, can be creative, have the psychological safety, the new buzzword, but it shouldn't be a buzzword because we should already be doing it, but they should have, like, I see peaches like, huh, psychological safety. So <laughs> you should, and, and what essentially what that is, is you, sh we, we can't have airmen afraid to speak up and say, hey, we need to do X, Y, or Z um, because they get maybe squashed by their leadership or whatever. You know, we need to have airmen that feel safe enough to be able to throw all their ideas out there. And of all the ideas that our airmen are going to throw out there, some of them are going to stick, some of them are not. But we still have to create that culture where there is creativity um, because we need airmen, especially in that future high-end fight that can think from the neck up. It's, it, it's a whole, we can't just have, Yes, people. It has to be people who understand the why and can help us develop um, the better way to do to do business. Yeah, Chief. And, and I think, honestly, looking back on my career, I think our community is, is pretty good at that, is, is it, getting it is. closest to the tactical problem and, yeah. and listening to those people. I remember my first transition from the team into ATC. It took a little bit of a uh, adjustment time to figure out the differences between um, – <laughs> how to speak to people as a staff sergeant on team versus how to speak to people as a staff sergeant with an AATC, people that outrank you and that kind of thing. Um, but I think uh, we're pretty good at that. And, and I think the, the Air Force would benefit from that a lot. Um, and then moving on, speaking of what's between people's ears, uh, we, we get a lot of questions about why we focus on formal education so much versus developing people and, and, and moving them forward in their, their specific jobs or their jobs, uh, multiple jobs, and becoming uh, good leaders and good te uh, technicians and tacticians in that way. Where, where's that balance between formal education and being good at, at what we do? So, so let me just add one thing real quick to, to your point before on your community does it well. A hundred percent. Like, again, it was in my formative years of being in an STS unit and watching a senior airman tell a lieutenant colonel, hey, sir, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Like, you know, <laughs> and doing it so tactfully and well, like, you know, I mean, that has shaped my perspective forever. And what it taught me is you can say anything that you want to say to anybody. You need to figure out the how and the when, and, and, and you got to know your trade, you know? So anyway, so, so I, I agree with you that, um, you know, for the most part, um, this community doesn't need that. And so I'm glad, keep it up. Um, and now back to the piece on, um, on the education thing, you know, I, I think that development and education, they go hand in hand, they're synergized. It's to the degree of how much do we emphasize on the education piece more than just development writ large. And, and, you know, that's one that people can argue all their points. And, and I think every leader looks at it differently. Um, education always makes folks better, but to, you know, uh, for me personally, um, I think we have a whole lot of people who have degrees and lots of education, but they can't lead us from here to there, you know? So, I mean, again, it's relative to, to what we do. When I got my job as a um, chief of PME here at the Pentagon, I'll never forget when the hiring authority was talking to me uh, and interviewing me, they're like, yeah, we see a, you don't have your master's degree. Is that a um, mistake on your records? And I'm like, uh, nope, it's not, you know? And I was like, I, ha I don't have a master's degree, you know, but I have a PhD in common sense. So, so to that point, I think as leaders, you know, uh, we, 
what we value will start to shift. You can see that now in, in just living today. Our, there, we have a lot of folks who don't value the college degree as much as they do certifications or certifications or licensing or whatever. And so again, I think it's all relative, depends on what you wanna do in life. Um, and I don't think that that is the tone at least um, for the enlisted corps in the United States and the Air Force, we value education, but we value what you do with the development that you get. And it's not the be all get all. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I've found myself putting different efforts towards different things in my time and my, you know, my career. And, you know, we already talked about your time at the two, four, all the way through you being the chief of, of PME, but there's one thing that all that time couldn't have possibly prepared you for. And that's when you take that uniform off and you're just, you know, Mrs. Bass out on the, on the, on the back end of this career. So what's going to motivate you? What's going to keep you going in that second half of life? Cause you're not, not anywhere close to done yet. So what's next for chief bass? What do you mean? I'm not close to done yet, sir. <laughs> I would, I would okay. You can be done if you her. want you. <laughs> so yeah, I, I'll be, ex I'll, I'll be honest, you know, um, I am very excited to, move the ball over the next three or four years. And then when it is time for me to retire and my kiddo will be finishing high school at that time, we very much look forward to um, living our best life somewhere in Texas, we think. And, and, and I'll be sitting on my back porch and, and I'll be the one watching to see the goodness that this next generation of airmen is gonna do. What I won't be doing is jumping online, criticizing um, that next generation on how they're doing Chief, it. Chief, I thought Again, we were done. I thought we were done, Chief. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Now we're done. I, 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 I did it one last time. We're done. <laughs> but, but I'm going to be living. That's what motivates me is living my best life, knowing that I did my piece. Um, and then I helped grow that next generation and left it better for my kiddos. No, I can get on board with that. So I do have one question for you that's um, and in our current climate right now, you know, the, the DOD at large is addressing it. I know the SACAF is getting after it. Um, so we, we want to talk about discrimination, right? Mm -hmm. So that is a, a hot topic in today's Air Force and the DOD in, at large. Um, so like for you specifically, I mean, you have gone from an airman to as high as you can possibly go on the enlisted side. So during that time, have you uh, encountered any kind of discrimination or anything like that? And, yeah. and, it, and, and not to bring up, you know, if, if there was, if it was hurtful or anything like that, I don't necessarily know that we need to go into details, but I think, you know, if you have experienced that, I think it's important for people to, to know and understand that. Yeah. Um, I've been very, fortunate and very blessed in my career being an ops that I have not dealt with very harsh discrimination that has caused me to, I think, take a step back. Like, have I been discriminated? I'm sure. Was it maybe something I didn't see? Perhaps. Um, but never to that extent. And, and I, again, I'm excited to say that because I came from you know, a lot, a great deal of my time working in special operations, you know, so in, and the brothers that I worked with, the brothers and sisters, we took care of each other. So I'm very thankful that my experience was not one that um, I felt discriminated against. Um, but that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And I just didn't know. I do remember times where I felt I was discriminated against based on age. Um, I, you know, I, and this is just kind of Air Force isms. Oh, you're still young, so you don't need that stratification. It'll come, you know, right? Like that kind of stuff. Um, it wasn't based on merit. It was based on like kind of age stuff. Um, it. Do we tell the truth in here? Is this like we're, real the, talk? we're in the trust tree? Absolutely. Okay, this always is always in the oh, trust let's tree. Go. Team room. I, I'm gonna be honest with you. Let's go. It wasn't until I got into this position that I really witnessed it for the first time in my career, and it was shocking. The day that I got announced to be the 19th Chief Master in the Air Force, you know, I mean, the phone's blown up, it, you know, everybody's calling, I mean, all, all sorts of stuff. 
And somebody sent me an article that, you know, announced that I was going to be it. And it says, uh, hey, you know, first first female serving as a senior enlisted leader in any military, been in the Air Force 27 years. And one of the comments on there was, she's been in the Air Force 27 years, and most of it must have been on her back to get in this position. Yo. So first of all, Chief, the internet rule number one, never read the comments. <laughs> and number two, what a terrible thing to put. I know. <laughs> I learned that that day, like that day I was like, I'm not reading a damn thing anymore, you know? Um, but to that point, Hey, that wasn't the first comment or, or and nor is it going to be the last again, there are people out there who, who, who will discriminate. Um, and, and I told my husband, I was like, this is the first time ever that I feel gender discrimination that, that now I'm understanding what many Many women have gone through where they are in yep. their position, not based on merit, that that thought is out there and it's blew me away. And I love to share that with 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 small groups, because unless they hear it from me, they don't believe that happens. So I yeah. have to tell you, this isn't a small this isn't a small group, just so you know, you're, okay. you're going well, out good. to 20,000 20, plus people. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it, dep it depends. It could be a small group. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll find out. Oh, smooth out. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate you sharing that with us. I mean, obviously, we're going to go through some of that um, diversity training and stuff with the stand down uh, fairly soon. So um, appreciate you talking about that. And then uh, last question. I know we would just want to be uh, sensitive of your time here um, is we always ask, you know, for a person in your position who's gone through a lot of different challenges in their life and have seen a lot of things, um, for a person that's trying to come into the air force right now, that 18 year old, specifically special warfare, they're trying to find the motivation and, you know, tackle these problems through college and that kind of stuff. And, um, we always ask, what is the best piece of advice that you would give somebody that's striving to be, make themselves better or to become part of the air force? Um, whether it's a quote or something that just motivates you every day as you wake up and do your work. I, I would tell that 18 year old, never, ever, ever give up, you know, um, play the long game. Sometimes our, where we think we want to go or, or what we're trying to pursue may seem like um, it got derailed or maybe a door might shut. Um, you might be going through the pipeline and you get discouraged because you, you know, you go from, you know, one pipeline and, and that door shuts. And now, you know, you might be cross training to another AFSC. I would tell that um, yeah. that 18 year old, don't give up, you know, play the long game and um, and have fun while you're at it, too. Everything has a reason. Everything, you know, happens on purpose. I'm a big believer of that. So um, have fun. Never give up. Oh, well, that's a great place to end it. So, man, we really appreciate you coming on. I, I, again, I'm kind of amazed that you're you're on here and we're talking to you. But uh, <laughs> like I said, maybe we've made it. Uh, and then maybe we'll get General Brown on here. Maybe you can kind of twist his arm and get him to come on. Because I'd love to have a, no big a deal. Good shoot that shot, with Chief. a fellow patch. All right. Oh, I'm, I'm going right. to shoot it right now. So, again, gotta shoot, thank babe. you for coming on. We really appreciate it, Chief. All right. Thanks, well, listen, hey, guys, I very much appreciate it. Um, I might be able to work and get General Brown on, but it might take a whole bunch of trench coffee. So I don't know. We'll, we'll, have, we'll have to figure that out. Well, maybe but trench hey, coffee and a an, uh, one's ready shirt. Th <laughs> thanks for everything that y'all do. And thanks for helping to grow and develop this next generation. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it, Chief. All right. We're out thanks, here. Chief.